I um, am going to speak to you this morning about uh, essentially a, a line of research that I've been conducting for the better part of the last two decades um, on examining informed consent and voluntariness in uh, among substance uh, using individuals. And um, I'll take you through some of the studies uh, that we've conducted. Informed consent, as we know, everyone here knows, is a key component in ethical research that seeks to ensure that uh, the understanding and rights of and protections of individuals, uh, the autonomous decisions regarding participation, and research has demonstrated generally poor um, rates of comprehension and importantly retention of consent information. And this is particularly true for vulnerable populations such as substance abusers, but also individuals who are involved in a criminal justice system um, and uh, in many of uh, our publications, we refer the, to them as doubly vulnerable populations be, for some of the reasons we'll talk about in a bit, but because they face not only um, some, uh, some levels of uh, some limitations uh, due to their uh, chronic drug use, but also because of their uh, the anxiety, concerns about liberty and uh, the things that come along with being arrested. This presentation will review, just do a general review of the primary tenets of informed consent. Um, and we'll discuss ways in which the informed consent process uh, could be compromised uh, among substance users uh, and provide practical evidence-based methods to address these issues. The basic principles of informed consent, its intent is essentially um, that individuals uh, may, must be capable of understanding the information. This gets at the issue of capacity, um, intelligence, uh, knowing, which means that um, the, the participants, potential participants must understand, be able to understand and retain the information that is provided to them at the, on the outset of research. And of course, be voluntarily, uh, voluntary so that individuals are able to make uh, autonomous decisions about their participation in the research um, that is being proposed. Now, beginning with intelligence, uh, of course, we're referring to, as I said, capacity, this sort of intrinsic capacity to understand, appreciate, and express a choice. Now, it can be compromised significantly among substance abusers uh, due to a host of factors. Uh, severe neurological effects of chronic drug use, uh, medical, medical conditions, medical uh, issues that occurred, crises and trauma that occurred during their use of, their years of use of drugs. Uh, and in, in many ways, th these can be immutable. Uh, but the primary strategy to date has been to use a legal surrogate. And getting back to something we talked about yesterday, of course, we have to be very concerned about the issue of justice when we're deciding who to, uh, to involve in our research and who to not involve in, in our research. For the longest time, we were more concerned about uh, using individuals, vulnerable populations, and avoiding using vulnerable populations because of the atrocities uh, in, you know, in Nuremberg and uh, uh, fleshed out in Nuremberg and some of the other Tuskegee and some of the other issues where we, we used vulnerable populations. But w as, uh, as Celia pointed out yesterday, um, it's also very important to look at the opposite too, to uh, also look at sort of justice and fairness. Um, as the uh, as being concerned about who you're excluding from the benefits of research. So if individuals are specifically uh, impaired in some way, we may not need to jump right to a surrogate, and there may also be negative consequences that may occur from that. Um, but uh, to the degree that it is, intelligence essentially connotes the idea at least in this respect, uh, regarding consent, uh, the sort of uh, 
capacity and in, in intrinsic capacity not to be able to understand the intervention. So um, a, um, a limitation. Knowing this, the sort of second major uh, sort of facet of uh, informed consent refers to one's uh, accurate understanding and appreciation of the study and their involvement. So substance abusers may experience uh, impaired attention, cognition, recall um, as a result of um, acute intoxication or withdrawal. Many of the clients that we see sometimes are tested, but oftentimes we rely on our um, own clinical judgment to determine whether or not they're, they're capable of um, uh, providing informed consent. Uh, Long-term effects of drug use on the brain, developmental and environmental factors that occur, poor nutrition, etc., limited education, comorbid health and mental health problems. All of these things, uh, in addition, if we're talking about criminal justice system, the situational anxiety and uh, you know, concerns about what they may, may view as bigger issues about their liberty, their, are, am I going to jail, am I, getting, uh, am I going to be able to return home, etc. All of these things can interfere with someone's ability to, to attend to the consent information and to process it effectively. Knowing this, essentially, uh, for most of the years of research that have been done on, on consent, improving consent, uh, understanding and recall, uh, most of the interventions have focused on the structure of form. And um, these are really trying to simplify the cognitive task because the assumption is that you know, individuals are, um, have some cognitive limitations. So if we simplify the task, if we use some, uh, change the structural form of the consent, uh, if we reduce reading level, everyone is familiar with probably IRB saying, no, we need to bring it down to a sixth grade level, a fifth grade level, lower, 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 but also maybe increase the font size, maybe uh, add supplementary materials such as pamphlets and other materials that might inc uh, increase uh, the uh, the potential participants' ability to uh, understand the consent process, but also things like videos and other supplementary materials. So uh, I'm not here to say that these these forms changes in structure form or these or these um, additions are not effective. Uh, but this is essentially what the what most of the research has focused on for many years. Um, also, not really a change in the structure of the form. There have been uh, interventions such as quizzes with corrected feedback, alternatively called test or retest, where you test an individual, uh, you do a consent quiz, you find out what they know, what they don't understand and then you repeat the information, you correct the information for them so that they better understand what's, what's going on. Um, and that's actually been uh, proven to be a, a fairly useful intervention. One of the things we wanted to test is, uh, in one of our earlier studies, is corrected feedback. And what we did is we conducted a randomized control trial where we administered a consent quiz at the time of consent and then monthly for three months. And the consent quiz evaluated understanding of uh, three major sort of elements of the consent form. So the first is study protocol and procedures. <clears throat> so this includes everything from, you know, what we talked about yesterday about randomization, uh, what the studies, uh, what the point of the study is, uh, when you'll have to come in, all the practical issues really um, related to the uh, research project. The second, of course, has to do with risks and benefits of participation. And, and we see this as a very key one uh, because clients do need to understand and appreciate the risks involved in what they're 
agreeing to participate in, um, but also understand the benefits and have a clear understanding of the two and be able to sort of make that weigh the, that risk benefit ratio. And then finally, um, human subject protections. These are the types of things that, you know, if something goes wrong, what do I do? Uh, can I contact, should I contact? Uh, because usually in a consent form we say that. If something goes wrong, you can contact the, um, the IRB chair, you can contact the principal investigator, these are the phone numbers, this is your recourse in case you're harmed in any way. So these are very important things for a client to know uh, because if they don't know and if they don't recall them, more importantly, um, it can lead to uh, essentially disenfranchisement. They're, they're, you know, if you don't know what to do, think of signing any contract or agreeing to anything. If you don't know that, you know, your car is under warranty when you're signing a, uh, you, when you're buying a car, you're not likely to use that warranty, right? So some of this information and maybe in business, that can be something that can be sort of like lost over in a small print or the fast speech that happens at the end of commercials. But it, when we're, we're talking about human lives and uh, the individuals that are so critical to the advancements that we're making in science, um, it is absolutely necessary. Um, we know that about half of participants, oh, in this study, half of participants were randomly assigned to receive corrected feedback on incorrect answers uh, on the quiz. So they would conduct, uh, we did a consent quiz with each of the clients. Uh, and each of the potential participants. And uh, we provided uh, corrected feedback to them. So we didn't go through the entire consent process again. We said, okay, you got, you understood most of it, but you didn't really understand what randomization was or the purpose of it. You didn't really understand what, how many times you had to come in. Uh, you didn't really understand what your recourse was in case you were harmed. Let's go over those again. The control condition, however, um, uh, we, they also conducted uh, consent quizzes, but they did not receive the corrected feedback over time. And I know what some of you are probably thinking that yes, if they had an absolutely necessary question, did we refuse to answer it? Of course not. Um, but on average, the individuals who um, in the experimental condition received more corrected feedback, uh, much more you know, um, than individuals in the, uh, so there was separation of conditions. I wanna make something very clear here too, is that um, most of you are familiar with consent quizzes, but how many people here think that consent quizzes or, or see consent quizzes used in every one of their human subject uh, research studies? Isn't that amazing? You know, we, we've, we've, we've identified that, you know, it's important for individuals to understand you know, one thing IRBs will not agree to is, and, and hold very steadfast to, is that we need a copy of everyone's signature, right? <laughs> you have to have the signed consent form in the file cabinet, and that's critical. But yet, here in 2016, years and years after we've kind of like already understood the importance of individuals understanding uh, their the protocol and the risks and benefits and their recourse and all of the things involved in research consent, uh, many, of the, many of the studies I come across still don't have a consent quiz. And many, and probably the majority that do, have a three or four item consent quiz that um, uh, I refer to as a CYA consent quiz. Um, for those of you who know what that means, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially for the, uh, the benefit of the researcher in many ways 
to get through the IRB. And many of them are very leading. And I, I don't think really do justice to uh, assessing whether individuals really understand what a consent, uh, what the consent says. You can see here the general three areas that we talked about, uh, the protocol procedures, which often some individuals may argue that these are perhaps the least, many of these are sort of the least important, you know, because we're at the time of the consent. Yeah, they need to know, you know, what they're going to do and what their responsibilities are. But when we get to really sort of the ethical protections, um, we're talking about the risks and benefits of the study, and we're talking about what their recourse is in, indeed if they're harmed. Our first study actually showed that uh, individuals who received no feedback uh, or received feedback actually did uh, slightly better than individuals who uh, received no feedback. Uh, it was significantly different, but as you can see, after two corrected feedback uh, repetitions, uh, only about 55% uh, individuals only recalled about 55% of the information. So that's certainly significant, but not clinically significant. So uh, when we look at uh, the use of corrective feedback that resulted in modest increase in recall of consent information, a significant increases in recall after two doses, uh, but it underscores the certainly underscores the importance of structured informed consent procedure as an ongoing process. And I'm sure most of you know that this that was a big uh, revelation and a big uh, new movement that's been around now for. Uh, well over a decade, but uh, I think that was a, a very good under, uh, sort of insight that uh, our policymakers and our IRBs and, um, uh, came across. Um, and it also gets to the idea of recall, which is, uh, I still argue this with a lot of non-ethics focused colleagues who think that consent is really something akin to signing a, uh, I'll just stick with the buying a new car, you know, contract, you signed it, it's done, you folded it up, maybe it's in your glove compartment, but you don't really need to remember what the APR is or what the warranty is. That's not true when we're, you know, when we're experimenting with people's lives, when we're using them for our studies. And um, it's, it's critical that individuals recall uh, a lot of the information. So six months down the road, if you don't remember that, and I've called clients, you know, we've probably all called clients for follow-up six months, 12 months after the, after the study, and they don't even remember being in the study, you know? So do you think they're going to remember that they have to call this IRB member or that they have to call, you know? So it's important to recall that. What if you go to the doctor and you're suddenly diagnosed with hypertension and you fail to remember that the hypertension was one of the uh, side effects that was listed in, in the consent during the consent that may have occurred due to the, med the experimental medication. Or you find out your boss um, approaches you and, and says, hey, I didn't know you were a drug addict. You were, you know, you were in a study, so there's breaches of confidentiality. If you don't know what the recourse is, if you don't know what the risks and benefits are, uh, these are important issues to recall. Uh, so recall is an important issue too, and I still have these arguments with, with colleagues continuously uh, about how important it is for, for it to be an ongoing process. Um, so although unfortunately corrective feedback was shown to improve recall, as you can see, it uh, participants recalled only about half of the information. And in our earlier studies, when we looked at cognitive, uh, uh, conducted research and examined a number of cognitive variables, everything from you know, simple IQ, you know, IQ tests to executive functioning, we, uh, we identified that only 50, about 50% 50 of the variance in consent recall uh, uh, was accounted for by cognitive factors. So that's, that's, that's a pretty decent amount if you think about the explained variance, 
but it still leaves about half of the variance to be explained. So we were scratching our heads and we were thinking, what else could it be? If it's not cognitive ability, because cognitive ability usually explains just about everything, um, what else could it be? Well, the, of course, the thing we came across was motivation. Believe it or not, some of the participants that you will be um, trying to engage in your studies and going through the consent process are really not interested in what you're saying. <laughs> and for a number of reasons, they're either distracted or they're daydreaming or it just sounds too wordy and you can tell them to read it while you read it aloud or you can do any number of things. But um, a lot of individuals have decreased attention, understanding and recall for many of the reasons we talked before, I talked about before. So we decided to examine the role of motivation through the use of incentives. Now, um, I have a lot of experience in contingency management, uh, but in this case, the incentives were not necessarily chosen to be the practical strategy to be used. Now, they might be, but we know that incentives are sometimes hard to find and hard to build into our studies. I would argue that it's not a lot of money uh, if you can get a big bang for your buck. But um, it's really more conceptual. It was a way of understanding whether or not individuals' <clears throat> motivation played a role in individuals' ability to uh, understand uh, consent. So in a simple two-group uh, study, we um, uh, initiated the consent process. I should say that most of the, almost all of the research that I've done has been done in the context of other ongoing studies that, that I've been funded for. So uh, I, I find that, I, I don't think I've ever um, conducted a sham study. So it, it, I think it's very beneficial to do these types of um, ethics studies in the context uh, of a host study that maybe has nothing to do with ethics but where you have real clients, it's real life, you're really working with, with individuals who are uh, challenged by these ethical uh, consent issues. So uh, prior to initiating the consent process, all participants were told that they would be completing a consent quiz and that they would be doing another consent quiz a month later. Uh, the only difference was that half of the individuals were randomly assigned and to, to be told that they would receive $5 for every correct response on a consent quiz. So 15 items on a consent quiz, $75 if you get them all correct. Now, you can pay me any amount of money to fly out this window and go back to my hotel to grab something. You know, I can't do it. So we're talking about capacity, we're talking about and, and if individuals are able to um, recall more information because they're incentivized, then it means, right, they have the capacity to do it. It means that we just haven't set up the conditions so that they can actually recall the information. And so what do we find? Uh, our hypothesis uh, was supported. Um, as you can see, the bars in blue are the control condition, the bars in red are the incentivized uh, condition, the ones that were promised $5 for each item, uh, answered correctly. And um, as you can see across the board, first, uh, the first pair of columns is uh, the total score on the consent quiz, the 15 items, and then of course the breakdowns that we talked about. So in each category, you could see that individuals in the uh, incentivized condition were able to recall significantly more uh, information. So we evaluated the efficacy of a combined remedial. Um, so the next thing we really wanted to know is that we knew, we knew that um, that that, that 
cognitive process explained in part of the variance. And now we know that motivational explains part of the variance. So we thought, let's combine the chocolate and the peanut butter and let's see what happens. Okay, and let's see if they both contribute and, and create an incremental effect. So we validated uh, an efficacy of a combined remedial and, and motivational procedure, which we refer to as the incentivized corrected feedback to ICF. And participants in this study, um, I, I'm, I didn't cite all the NIDA, the NIDA um, sites, so uh, if this video makes its way to NIDA, I'm in big trouble. But I do want to say that all of these studies were supported by National Institute of Drug Abuse, and without them, you know, it, it, these uh, studies wouldn't have been possible. Uh, but uh, so uh, again, a very simple two-group randomized controlled trial where individuals were randomly assigned to receive either both the consent uh, um, with corrected feedback and incentives, so this combined condition, or to receive only, um, to receive no corrected feedback and no incentives. Now we could have complicated and made it a uh, you know, two by two factorial design, but um, for the most part, I really like, um, I, I grok to the, the two group, very simple uh, sort of elegant designs that, that allow me to sort of interpret the results very simply, uh, very easily. So we hypothesized, of course, that the incentivized corrective feedback procedure would improve understanding and recall of consent information over and above either intervention alone because it addressed, it simplified the consent process, right, by, 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 um, by, by providing the corrected feedback, but it also motivated individuals through the incentives. Again, not something that necessarily needs to be seen as a practical. So if some of you were thinking, ah, oh, we could never do incentives, that's besides the point. What we wanted to use that as, as a way of measuring whether or not motivation is critical. What did we find? So this was looking at the total score. As you can see at this point, uh, by quiz five, which is um, you know, several months into the project, we, um, uh, there's a significant difference on total score such that incentivized corrective feedback uh, clients uh, understood about 83%. And we can, or I think we can agree at this point that that's pretty, that's probably clinical significance in, in addition to uh, statistical significance. When we look at the protocol, uh, same thing shows uh, by quiz five, 84% of individuals in the uh, experimental condition were able to, uh, uh, individuals in the experimental condition were able to recall 84% of the information. When we look at something very, very important, I think the, the protections, um, it, it actually is almost 90%. Um, individuals recall almost 90% of the information. When we looked at risks and needs, uh, the risks actually uh, were, uh, again, significantly and higher. And when we looked at benefits, uh, again, there was a significant difference, probably not a clinical, uh, clinically significant difference. But um, I think this is because the, the study really only had one benefit. Um, it really was just sort of the altruistic uh, benefit. So in summary, um, we can improve knowingness among substance abusers who enter research studies. And um, effective strategies are, probably should include both remedial and motivational strategies to improve understanding. Now I wanna speak a little bit about voluntariness. Uh, in terms of voluntariness, you know, this is, of course, participation free of coercion, undue influence. Substance abusers are often uh, have certain situational factors that interfere with their ability to make autonomous decisions. This is particularly true in some of the drug court studies that we conducted this research in, where you're worried about what you're saying, what you're doing, if I participate in the study, uh, will the judge, if I don't, if I say no, will the judge 
think badly of it, will affect my disposition, uh, will, you know, I, I know if somebody came in to me and I was arrested and said, you know, we want you to meet with this person and do a study, I might have some of those same feelings that I'd better just do anything they say. And afterwards, we want you to stand in a corner on your head and, you know, just for a few minutes, it's like, like, what wouldn't I do? I know people are different, but, you know, to protect my liberty and be able to uh, stay on the good side of the law. So there's lots of these uh, kinds of pressures. Uh, and they may perceive those pressures correctly or incorrectly uh, uh, that cooperation is necessary because in many cases the judge really doesn't know what's going on. Most cases it's not going to affect their disposition or their liberty, but even their perception, whether it's true or false, can affect their decision to participate in the research. So it's still coercion, but it's still uh, undue influence. So the first thing we wanted to do is we want to develop an assessment because there really wasn't an assessment out there that measured people's coercion uh, to uh, perceive coercion, uh, pr coercive pressures. There were a couple out there. There's the MacArthur Admission Experience Survey that was modified from the, uh, for uh, involuntary psychiatric commitments, but there really was nothing for this population. So um, we wanted to develop an instrument, and even those measures, they, a lot of those measures told you whether somebody was coerced or not, but not what the source of the coercion was, so or the misperception was. By identifying sort of a, through an inventory and an assessment what the source of the uh, the misperception was, or the perception was. It allowed us to correct, it would allow the researcher to correct misperceptions. Oh, oh, let me explain exactly how this worked. The judge does not get this information. Uh, this cannot in any way influence your disposition. Uh, they, you know, this is not part of court record, etc. Can address real and existing issues and more accurately assess eligibility for research participation. So if you're able to resolve those misperceptions or those perceptions, um, or as I said, the second one, I didn't want to gloss over that, there may be real existing issues where the court really is, um, or the research team or someone really is coercing someone to uh, participate. We want to be able to address those as well. And eventually it could be built into existing consent quizzes and procedures. Um, my hope is that eventually this is part of the consent process so that we can assess at the time of consent not only with their understanding and appreciation of what the study is, but also uh, examine what their perceptions of undue influence or coercion are. So we developed the CAS uh, with my colleague Karen Dugash, uh, brief 13 item measure, of course, the pressures came out of meetings with uh, CAB, our CAB with um, uh, a, uh, a multidisciplinary panel of, uh, of scientists and researchers and people in the field and also uh, uh, through discussions, as I said, with clients. Um, and it can be used to identify individuals who may need enhanced consent procedures who may not be suitable for research or may be compromised by real or perceived. And this is what it looks like. So we have a number of items here. I won't read through all of them, but you can kind of uh, skim them if you like. Um, you know, some of them are, are fairly straightforward and, and look like some of the perhaps coercion skills that you've seen before. But here, of course, we're focusing in right on the drug court sample. So that's why we have things like judges and we have case managers and other individuals, counselors. Um, and really what we're trying to get at is who, if anybody, is uh, and what, if anything, is compelling you to participate in something that should be your free autonomous decision. 
And again, just to reiterate, you know, it provides us a source then. So we can then tackle that source. We can address that with the client. We can address it with the system if it's, if it's actually real. So in terms of the psychometrics, uh, uh, the test retest reliability uh, showed um, an average exact agreement of 87%. Uh, we conducted convergent validity by comparing it to a similar scale that was um, the Iowa coercion assessment questionnaire, a more general measure of coercion, and it had uh, higher CS scores than those who did not, but the convergent validity was there. And in terms of discriminative validity, uh, we compared it to locus of control, which endorsed uh, with it external um, externals endorsing more items and internals endorsing fewer items. Another study uh, that I want to quickly get to is um, one that we conducted to see if there was a way that we could reduce coercion uh, at the time of consent. So what we did is we, we lined up what we called research intermediaries. They're alternatively called ombudsmen and, and other things. And actually I was speaking, the idea came, I was speaking to, uh, to uh, Dr. Grisso, and uh, this is years ago now, but I remember calling him and saying, you know, I'm at a loss. Like, what can I do with clients to help them, you know, better, you know, better understand that they don't have to participate if they don't want to, you know, especially when they're behind bars or they're incarcerated. And uh, he said at the time that for juvenile, for adolescent participants, they had a practice in place where uh, they had to have an ombudsman sort of visit the adolescent in prison or in jail and uh, talk to them about their, you know, the nature of the research and the, the free will. So originally we hypothesized that it may actually, actually improve consent recall and understanding and improve autonomy. Um, what we found is that it really uh, only had an effect on autonomy, but that's good. What we did is we set it up so that um, if we had any control over these intermediaries, it wouldn't have worked, right? So we contracted with a local university. We got doctoral students to participate. We provided a stipend to their supervisor, but not directly to them. And the supervisor completely, you know, worked with the clients. We had nothing to do with them. So when they went into, so what would happen is our research assistant would go in, conduct, uh, begin, you know, review the consent uh, procedure, begin the consent procedure. But before the consent procedure was over, before they signed informed consent, they were then introduced to this intermediary, this neutral intermediary, who said, look, I don't work for TRI, I don't work for the court, I don't work for the treatment program. My only reason for being here is to make sure that you understand what was said to you um, and to understand that you don't have to participate unless you absolutely want to. And there's going to be no, you know, it's like all the things we say in the consent, but of course we're, we, we may be perceived as biased. We're the researchers that want you in our studies, right? So the research intermediary was able to be neutral. So we evaluated that uh, and we measured perceived coercion using the coercion assessment scale. And as you can see here, individuals in the intermediary condition um, had uh, significantly lower coercion, perceived coercion scores than individuals in the standardized, uh, in the st uh, treatment as usual, where only the, uh, they were consented only by the uh, research assistant. Now what this also adds to, in addition to these findings, which I think are very important, um, it also adds further discriminant validity for the CAS. Right, because the CAS was able to differentiate between individuals who uh, received the intermediate, intermediate condition or the standard condition. Now, the very last study that I want to talk to you about, I wasn't going to get into my payment research at all, but there is one piece of it that is, uh, is critical. Um, 
There's, of course, the widely held belief that providing incentives in the way of cash or larger incentives uh, reduces uh, autonomy, is perceived as coercive. I think that's the wrong use of the term, but as an undue influence. Um, and often then they use this, these gift cards and other non-monetary goods to incentivize clients for, for participation. So what we did in a couple of studies is we, um, in, uh, in uh, first a two by three and then a two by four parametric randomized control trials, we examined, uh, we offered individuals different amounts and different uh, mag different magnitudes and different uh, modes of reinforcement incentives to uh, come in for a six-month follow-up. And uh, I mean, th this is something that was a truism in clinical research, in clinical um, practice. You can't give cash to substance users. You can't give larger amounts of cash. So let's use all these other ways. And unfortunately, what it did is it, it significantly reduced the representation, uh, the representativeness of our follow-up cohorts. So it rendered a lot of studies unpublishable, undefensible. So this, is a, this was a big issue. Um, but uh, at follow-up, what, what happened is they'd come in for the six-month follow-up. They'd received their predetermined, randomized, de randomly determined uh, amount of cash um, or gift certificate. Um, and then we would ask them to come back, and they provide a urine. And then we'd ask them to come back three days later to do a satisfaction survey and some other things, reconsent them, and they'd provide a, provide a second urine at that time. So we're able to see for, you know, in, in terms of looking at whether or not the higher amounts were cash actually led to new drug use, we were able to determine that because we had uh, a, a urine sample at, at, at the time of six months and three days later. But that's not really the point I want to get across here. I really want to get across the idea of perceived coercion. And um, while the main factors in the studies that we looked at were the um, one of the main factors was whether or not they engage in new drug use, uh, whether larger amounts or cash incentives precipitated new drug use. Um, coercion was another thing. And people felt like you can't pay people these large amounts of money, which, of course, Christine Grady and many others now say this, these really aren't large amounts of money, but um, that they would, they would precipitate uh, drug use. So what you can see here from our findings in study one, we, uh, these are both NIDA-funded studies also, we examined uh, 10 40 and $70. In study two, we rose that as high as $160 for att um, attending the six-month follow-up. And as you can see, in terms of perceived coercion, there were really no significant differences. Um, there was this one little uh, thing that happened here and this really is sort of an artifact of uh, so few individuals coming in for a $10 uh, gift certificate. So that kind of muddied the waters there. But really, um, as you can see, there's really no significant difference between cash or gift certificates or even magnitude of the incentives. By the way, just um, uh, increased follow-up rates. So that was a good thing. Um, as you can see, and um, to a point actually where um, at, at $100, we found that it met the minimal criteria for what a follow-up rate should be. And most of us aren't satisfied with 70% follow-up rates, but, but that's, that's really sort of the minimum that you can get um, without sort of questioning the reliability of your findings. Um, other thing we saw there was that even in the two studies, the, um, the magnitudes that we got for $70 were exactly the same. So that added f further validity to what we were doing. And of course, with no, uh, there was no new drug use either, 
regardless of the amount of payment or the amount of, or the, uh, the mode of delivery, either in cash or gift certificate. And it also decreased tracking calls, which uh, saved a lot of money on the part of the investigator. So in conclusion, uh, substance abusers present unique challenges uh, related to informed consent to research. Uh, research has provided useful strategies and tools to help ensure the intelligence, knowingness, and voluntariness of consent in studies with this population. And there's a whole number of future efforts that should focus on the development of novel strategies and ways to facilitate broader use. Um, so this is really this is really the kind of stuff that we hope that uh, that you uh, can use in your research. Um, as I said, a lot of my research was done in criminal justice populations on drug courts, but once I had those studies, I felt like a kid in a candy store because now I could do uh, ethics, randomized controlled ethics studies in my own host studies. So there's lots of things to look at. For just for one example, it, this idea of motivation. We motivated them with five dollars, you know, and. You know, IRBs will argue that they don't have enough money and funding sources. Well, I don't think it's a lot of money to ensure that people understand their, um, their consent better. But um, think about when we're talking about motivation as the larger concept, right? It doesn't have to be money. There may be many other ways to motivate your clients, to grab your clients, uh, your, your potential participants' attention so that they focus on the consent form and uh, understand, better attend to and understand what you are saying. So thank you, that's... Uh, yeah. David, I had a, I had a comment and question. Uh, sure. Uh, the comment is that uh, the research is really good, but it's not very good for That's, that's an excellent question, Celia, and, um, you know, I, I should say that, okay, so I tend to grok to those journals because, you know, a lot of my other research is published in those journals, but um, I, I, I saw, and I also share the, um, the feeling that, that you expressed yesterday that, um, you know, just preaching to the choir in our own journals is, is not really su uh, sufficient. Um, I think I think the way we did it is just, it, it really is sort of finesse in the writing. You have to, you have to um, focus not only on the ethical protections, because I talked to some of, I won't mention names, but very established, world-renowned investigators about this stuff and their eyes roll over. You know, because you're just going to make it more difficult for me. IRB is going to be. You're standing in the way of research, etc. But once you start talking about the representativeness of the cohort, the inability to publish research, I mean, we've conducted large interstate studies where we got no. Uh, you know, I, I won't mention the studies either, but th these are. This is probably a decade or two ago, where we could we couldn't get any publications because the follow-ups were so miserable. And the same is true if you can't recruit the sample that you propose to NIDA, that's a huge issue. So it's not something that you just argue about in the paper, but that you should argue about in your IRB proposal and make it clear that these are things that are necessary to make the research a success. So that's not true with all ethical dilemmas, I understand that, with all ethical issues. But to the degree that you can actually uh, use it to uh, use the ethical research to uh, as a rationale for improving the outcomes of the studies and all the money there, the funder, the funding, uh, inst uh, the, the funders are, are putting into your research, I think the better you are. So that's one example. 
guess you would, how your studies would inform scientific validity and increase that. And, yes. and to take that one step further, David, and to put that into the language that the IRB will understand, okay, is that scientific validity is necessary for there to be any benefit to generalizable knowledge. Right. And therefore, to not, to, to conduct a a study that does not lead to generalizable knowledge in some way is inherently unethical. Right. And so you can take your statement and if you put it in the language that the IRB is familiar with under which it operates, mm -hmm. then it helps the educational process for the IRB as well. Oh, I agree. Absolutely. But your data are critical for educating IRBs And funding sources too, because I really do th think yes. you know when you're building in a you know a secondary, a tertiary, or exploratory hypothesis into your study, which you should, I really encourage you to do that because um, you know that's where we get our data. You know, if I wasn't conducting some of these pilot studies in the context of other studies that were ongoing, I wouldn't ha I wouldn't have the stuff necessary for my next R ethics R one. But you need to convince the, um, if you just throw ethics research in as a tertiary hypothesis uh, to a review group that's not looking at ethics, uh, you know, it's just, again, their eyes are going to roll over like some of my colleagues. So you need to, again, just as we do with IRBs, bring that in and say, you know, if you want this to be generalizable, if you want us to be, you know, in order to be successful, we need to build in these incentives. We need to test um, whether or not individuals really understand their consent information. And you know, there's so many other questions to answer. But any other? Uh, Let me, uh, yes. I want to pose questions for the, for the fellows. So, sure. so David gave us some really uh, interesting insights, methodological issues on informed consent, the relationship of informed consent to both intelligence motivation, uh, format. Uh, he also talked about voluntariness and the issues of coercion. Thinking about that, which ones are in some sense relevant to what you're doing and the extent to which, I mean, he also raised a challenge for all of us is that, and I'm guilty as well in terms of not doing informed consent quizzes typically in, in research and especially challenging I think I was thinking about it in terms of online research, which is very popular now. But anyhow, if you can be thinking about um, what does this say to you, both in terms of the incentive issue and paying drug users, um, the informed consent, the understanding of what you're doing, do they even understand what the apps are or, or a certificate of confidentiality, uh, and how the factors that David talked about that plays in in a very different way than maybe they've been thinking about it before. So does anybody want to begin? Once again, you don't have to, you know, just what did it spur you as something that, that's related? You don't have to design something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the issue, I'm working on with issues of trust, generally in research, and what supports trust or the barriers uh, to a trusting relationship. And uh, I think the, the issue of payment phrase is critical. Uh, in, you know, I don't think, I don't know how participants think about trust. I, I am not sure they think about trust in research the way we, we would approach trust in research. But I know that uh, a big, we recruited 300 participants in the first year, and I think a big draw was the payment and the payment structure. Uh, we use a methodology, it's called RDS, Responding Driven Sampling, and it's, uh, it's great. It's like an intermediate, intermediary. But instead of a professional intermediary, they are intermediaries themselves. They are the agents of the, their own recruitment. We just uh, got eight seats, uh, the initial recruiters. We select the eight, and we give three coupons each participants. That bring people like you, that are using like you, like you, that are active and, and they're you know, beyond 18, and they bring them. Uh, but of course, they have to tell them what the study is about. So in that sense, the issue of comprehension of the consent and comprehension of the study is facilitated because, you know, when they come to the study, they have a sense of what the study is about. You know, what's going to happen with the risk cards and with the benefits, which mostly for them, the benefits translate in terms of money, how much money we're going to pay them. So, yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, um, but coming back to the, the question you raised, the, the, the trust issue, the payment, you know, paying them in a way that they feel is fair uh, is critical. And just uh, uh, just a sideline, you mentioned the issue of uh, I totally agree with you. Payment is uh, critical, and without payment, you wouldn't have any participants. Out of the 300, we do it, we did HIV testing and HC testing. That's a draw. That's important for them. Uh, it's anonymous and it's confidential. And if, if, if they want to do an HIV test in Puerto Rico, they have to go to a public health and, uh, kind of procedure, epidemiological, with you know, personal information, disclosing a lot of things. And if they found to be HIV positive, they have to disclose the partners. So that was important for them, in addition to the payment. But payment is critical. The, the, the gift certificate thing is awful. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. You are shortchanging your participants. Because if you give them a $20 uh, gift certificate, what you're actually giving them is not that you're not giving them money, you're giving them out of a 20, you're giving them at best 10. They're going to sell it on the street. Right. Like they sell everything. So it's and we actually found that, that individuals who received cash were more likely to buy essentials, whereas individuals who received gift certificates were more likely to buy luxury items and things that they did, really didn't need. So. Or sell, them. Them. Yeah. Yeah. or sell them. Yeah. It's part of the street economy for producers. And if you give them something that is not money, they're going to find a way of converting it into money and they're going to lose half. Mm -hmm. So it's not that a gift certificate is not coercive, it's totally shortchanging them. And that affects your trust. I mean, the, in the way they say, they, let's say the incentive they have to participate goes down. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes your research less. And I think it has to do with trust. And think about the, the idea of justice as well. Right. Oh. I mean, in other studies, medical studies, without substance users, individuals are being, bi you know, biological studies, other things, uh, individuals are being paid, you know, $500, $800. And uh, here we're arguing about sometimes, you know, 10 or $20 uh, because we, we knew <laughs> Um, as, as Celia mentioned yesterday, this goes a long way in convincing IRBs to change their, and to allow for uh, cash and for, for increased remuneration. But uh, for a long, the longest time, we were we were treating these individuals unfairly, and I think in, in many cases we still are.
connected to this treatment facility, I, your, your participation in this study will not affect your treatment outcomes. It won't affect the way staff um, perceive you. They won't even know that you're a part of this, this, this study. This study will take place off site. So even though I communicated all that, it does make me still wonder um, if a part of them thought, well, if I participate, you know, it could get back to the staff. They, you know, she has built this relationship here, you know. Um, so it makes me wonder about the volunteers. Did they really want to participate? Did they feel they had a choice in saying no? You might want to think about that as a, some kind of question. Now, one, one possibility is, again, I don't know that this would um, address the actual consent, the formal consent, but in terms of consent being an ongoing process, um, there may be, especially in this day of technology, there may be uh, ways to do booster reminders of key aspects of the consent that could be texted or uh, you could contact individuals intermediate. Uh, it depends on what's, what the requirements are. But uh, as an ongoing process, I think this really ties well together with that.
touched on, so because of the population that I'm working with and the fact that my research is online, I think a lot about uh, consent, how do you assess that somebody is actually even reading the right. consent materials or viewing it if you're doing it in a video form in a way that's meaningful other than just sort of, because if you think about it, like, like an iTunes consent, you just scroll to the bottom and you click yes, <laughs> right? And so nobody reads it and it's basically a bunch of legal jargon that's meaningless. Um, but because my population, I really need for their protection to waive, you know, guardian consent. I really need them to like, I need to show that they can really understand it and have faith that they're like comprehending both what I'm asking them to do, the risk and benefits, and what they should do if something goes wrong, which could very well happen. Um, and so I think a lot about that process, and I actually built in a, a question part to my study uh, okay. to assess consent comprehension because of that. Um, I really liked, I'm gonna have to tweak that, I think, given what you just said. Um, and then the other thing I think a lot about is trust, right? If I'm presenting this stuff online, they're not meeting me in person, they're not meeting research assistants in person. How do you establish that you're not just some Yahoo off the street who's doing whatever with this information and data in a way that is very respectful to them and you know engages in that sort of trust part of the process? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's there are so many things. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Again, you have uh, you don't have much time with your clients, uh, but I yeah you know, one idea I think would be to again I think as we discussed briefly yesterday is to give them more of the rationale, you know, and uh, you know if you could have like an elevator speech really kind of prepared to kind of told them, you know, this has been looked at, this has been looked at, this has been looked at, but we really don't know what. Um, this is the next logical question, and we we really need it, and this is why. Maybe you could bring some of them over to really understanding that you're just not trying to get private information from them or personal information. But. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the consent piece was really relevant for me. The interesting thing for my study is it's more about how much they understand about the consent they're giving to a non-researcher. Uh, but really those data are shared in two ways. They're shared either with third party marketing firms or they're shared with researchers. Mm -hmm. So it is still very relevant for research trust to understand what kind of consent you're giving to these app makers and developers to share your information with researchers. Uh, totally separate, uh, we, I'm a co-I on a grant that we just got to do uh, an intervention for substance using at risk young MSM uh, and it'll be delivered in CBOs where they go for their HIV testing. And so it was really interesting for me to think about to what extent do they realize that they could still get the HIV testing and still use the CBOs if they don't agree to participate in the research. And really thinking about the voluntariness of that as well. The other thing I heard about for you, uh, for your um, MRP, is, is the motivation. You know, because mm -hmm. I know most of us, we could care less when we're clicking. You know, you know, whenever we download an app or whatever it is that we're downloading, and so that motivation, that one of the reasons, not like they don't understand, they may not care. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, and that, that may be relevant to you too, in terms of the extent to which they actually care. We could tell them all what we want about the COC, or we could tell them mm -hmm. everything. And so I don't know, you know, especially it might be easier for you because you're doing something quantitative, yeah. to ask about motivation, and that they're, our, our younger people in particular, um, younger than us, <laughs> not concerned about confidentiality right, anymore right, right. because they share so much. So I think that- But in terms of motivation, it's also, I mean, true, so for the app developers, they don't want people to be motivated to understand the terms right. of service. We are trying to improve informed consent, but they are trying to just get their legal authorizations to do whatever they want. They don't want people to read the terms of service and understand them. Yeah. So. That's also, how do you build a relationship with an app as a researcher when your premise is informed consent and their premise is essentially getting people to give them waivers to do whatever they want yeah. without being informed about yeah. what they're doing. Okay, well, thank, thank you so much.